And then I also do behavior-based feeding with them. So if they are giving me substantial behavioral signals that they are actively hungry and hunting, I will feed them no matter how long it's been since their last meal. Their brain has been dormant for so long. All their brain has been used for is to drink and eat. So you could have a tree in front of a snake and they don't know what to do with it because that neural pathway is kaput. And, it's, and unfortunately what happens sometimes under captive management when they don't have enough environmental complexity and stimulation, when they don't have outlets for this higher functioning, um, that all that's firing are those fear centers. And the amygdala is highly involved with fear learning and fear acquisition. And the hippocampus is highly involved with suppressing that and regulating that. But what happens if you aren't stimulating the hippocampus to do problem solving and to cognitively um, think about tasks and giving the brain things to do, then it is sitting there atrophying and those synapses aren't firing. And the ones that are firing constantly are the ones in the amygdala that are telling the animal, I'm afraid. And you can acquire a generalized fear or reactivity now of everything. So now the animal's fearful out of context. So maybe initially they were afraid when they should have been. It was a legitimate, oh man, this person opened the drawer and startled me and it scared me and that's appropriate. But now, because that's the only interaction they're having, it's the only activity they get, they're not getting to use the other brain areas. The fear center is just going crazy. And now they're generalizing that fear to everything. So now it's not just when the drawer opens, it's when they get taken out, it's when they get taken to the vet, it's when something else happens because the most active part of the brain are the synapses that are involved in fear or reactivity. And that's just an example. You know, if you give the snake things to do constantly where they're constantly climbing or swimming or burrowing or um, figuring out how to get out of their enclosure, those are the synapses that are firing all the time. And those are the ones that are continued to grow and build branches. And the ones um, involved in fear acquisition and fear learning aren't getting utilized. And so those are the ones that are gonna become diminished. So the more choice rich life an animal has, the more resiliency they build, the more challenging experiences that they can encounter in their lifetime and be successful at, the more confident the animal is going to be and the less overall fearful they're going to be. Welcome back to the Reptiles and Research podcast. Today's guest is Laurie Torini, a behavior expert and animal trainer who focuses on training snakes. Now this episode is the pinnacle of royal python husbandry. I would even go as far to say that you're doing your bull python a disservice by not watching this video. That's how valuable and important this video interview is. We would like to thank our sponsor Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring the channel. If you would like to go through the links in the appropriate channels or in the show notes and if you buy an enclosure from Custom Reptile Habitats we get an extra kickback and no extra cost to you so you can support the show by upgrading your care and in this episode if you aren't keeping your raw python in the way that you may may want to after listening to this interview now's the perfect time to do so if you want to support the running of this show then go ahead to patreon slash reptiles and research and for one pound a month you can support the running of the show and gain access to all the features that are over there on patreon and last but not least the reptile merch store is doing a sale at the moment on their raw python designs which i have one here this is the pun on the royal aspect of the royal python. I actually really like that. So if you use code Regis at the moment, you get a 10% discount at the reptilemerchstore.com. Other than that, let's get into today's episode. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Laurie. Um, could you just give us a little bit about who you are for people who don't have a clue or never met you before? Yes, my name is Laurie Trini. I'm a certified animal behaviorist and animal trainer. I also have an applied science degree in zookeeping, and I am the director of Spirit Keeper Animal Sanctuary in Colorado in the United States. So in addition to my directorial duties there, I also run my own business in animal behavior and training where I work with multiple species. Primarily right now, I'm working with snakes, dogs, horses, and cats. I actually have quite a few clients right now that have cat behavior issues that I'm consulting on. That's really cool. And obviously, you've got a lot of snakes. How many snakes have you actually got for sample size, people wondering about all of this? 
Oh, you know what? I just updated my list uh, the other night. I think it's 100. Did I tell you how many I had? Like 115 or something? Something like that. Yeah, it was 107 or something like that. It was quite a bit. I usually keep it right around 100. I've gone over lately adding a few extra, extra, a few more royals. And the reason that I've ended up adding so many Python Regis is because I'm I'm seeing such a huge behavioral diversity in that species in particular, whereas I had um, 34 Morelia Bredley here at one time. And if you were going to get one, I could feel pretty confident in telling you what their overall temperament and personality would be like in general, although they're all individuals and will vary some, you know, I would have some certainty in saying if you want to get a Morelia Bredley it's most likely going to do these things and appreciate these things in its enclosure, et cetera. And what I'm finding with the Python Regis is that's really much more difficult for me to do because they have such a huge variability in their temperaments and behavior and preferences. And I'm wondering if that's not um, a side effect of captivity and the fact that they are bred in such huge numbers and also still being imported. So you've got a lot more genetic diversity, which is going to lend to more behavioral diversity. So certain lines may have different behavioral traits than others and breeders should know the temperament and behavioral tendencies of the snakes that they're producing. Some are really good about sharing that and others aren't because they just don't pay attention to that aspect of it. But I've added, now I have 25 Python Regis here, and that's so that I can really get a good feel for general behavioral tendencies within the species, and then the places where they tend to be very um, different sometimes or variable. Their, their behavior is more along a spectrum than all kind of clumped in the middle. Do you think that's kind of also because how widespread they are geographically and how widespread a behavioral repertoire they would probably need to adapt to all of those niches within that geographic range it certainly could be and anytime i'm looking at behavioral husbandry under captive management i always look at natural history and natural biology first because that's going to inform us where to start it's not that we can't add additional things or that our snakes may not prefer things under captive management that they would never encounter in the wild because they do but when i first start i look at the species natural history and biology and the, the natural ethogram of behaviors you would see in situ. And then I try to set up opportunities for them to do those things here. So with royals, if they are being exposed to very, like corn snakes, for example, they're all over the United States. And I guess now there's populations of them in some foreign countries. So they're, they're very adaptable and they're a generalist species. They can eat so many different things. And so you're gonna find corn snakes that live on the ground. You're gonna find some that spend most of their time in trees. I mean, they adapt to all of these different environments. And so Python Regis are that widespread and encountering those different environmental circumstances in the wild, then it certainly can carry over into captivity, especially if wild genetics are still being um, imported and mixed with the genetics that have been under captive management for years and years. Um, so I think we were looking at a paper and they were saying that they were active at night and it was only for a few hours. Is that what you're finding with your collection? Um, as a whole, yes, they're active in the evening. Some are active in the middle of the night. I have a couple that tend to wake up and when it's daylight and be more active during the day. And I would say that they're outliers. I have 25 and I'm thinking of two in particular that I see out and active during the day a lot. Like they'll just be wide awake during the day and that's when I work with those two. But the rest of them are either awake in the evening. And so there's a whole group that kind of wake up early to late evening. So right as it's getting dark and then maybe midnight, you know, they're active. And then I have a few others that I don't see until after midnight and they're active sort of later at night and early into the morning and then they put themselves away. So I do see variability with that. But overall as a species, I would say if someone was going to get one as a pet, don't expect to see it too much during the day. That's the time when, when they're typically resting somewhere and they do tend to hide when they rest. Some species don't. 
Um, a lot of the Morelia will rest and sleep during in the wide open. Like I see several of my Morelia are sound asleep right now, but they're just out in the open on a, on a ledge or on a rock. So most of the Python Regis are going to rest or sleep inside a hide or um, a crevice. Many of them, you, I can see them, but they're like squished between the wall and a piece of enclosure furnishing, or they're inside a, a log and I can see them in there. So they are gonna mostly hide during the day, occasionally come out and bask, um, but mostly if you're getting one as a pet and you're not a night person, I'm not sure it's the best pet for you because that's when they're really active and that's when I see them doing lots of behaviors when they're most alert. I'd agree because um, out of my 11, Oksana behind me, she's the only one that comes out when the lights come off straight away. She's the first one up. Everyone else, they're probably up after I've gone to bed. I don't ever really see them coming out. Yeah, and so I work at night. I um, work till about three or four in the morning. And that is specifically because I want to see the snake's behavior. I want to work with them when they're naturally awake and active. And I want to see when they're doing during the time when it's natural for them to be awake. And I'm also just naturally a night person. So it works out really well. <laughs> Do you think that's why, because there's so many people who say, oh, I've got it in the viv, but it never leaves its hide. It's because it's when everyone's asleep. Absolutely. If you have a species that's primarily awake in the evenings or early morning or in the middle of the night, and that's their natural time to be active and alert and doing activities, but you're only seeing it in the middle of the day. And so you're observing it from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and you look at it and think, well, gosh, it doesn't need a bigger enclosure. It's just all coiled up and it just always sits on that ledge or it's always in this hide and I, I never see it move around. We're only seeing it during a snapshot of its day, of its life, of its 24 hour period. And when it wakes up during its normal day, if you were observing it, you would see it moving, you would see it behaving, you would see it very active and alert and doing lots of things that you are maybe not even aware that it ever does if you're just watching it during the time when it's asleep that would be like aliens coming to earth and um if you're a person that normally sleeps at night from 10 a.m to 6 a.m and the aliens are here at midnight and they only ever see you at midnight they're gonna think mm -hmm. all humans do is sleep in a dark room on a square box and so that's that's what they're gonna think of people but if they come during the day, then of course they would see all the hustle and bustle and everything humans are doing. And so we can't just look at an animal at one time in its life and think that's how it is all the time. That's ridiculous. Do you find there's a seasonal difference? So when you're coming from summer to winter, there's a difference in activities or? I do. Sometimes mine, of course I have this large number and they're very, different in, in some of their personalities. But the first original two that I got, which I pretty much tried to be hands off with and not prompt too much behavior because I really just wanted to see what they did. I put them in an environment and I just wanted to watch what they did. They are more active like in the spring and summer, fall, in the winter, they're less active. Um, their appetite increases during warmer weather, decreases during cooler weather. These two particular ones, they do hide all day, either between their hide and the wall or in their hide. And then at night, and, and they're later to wake up, like 10 p.m. or midnight, they wake up, they leave their hide, they, they move around their enclosure a bit, and they go to one of two of their favorite ambush spots, and they get into an ambush position where they sit the rest of the night. And then in the morning, they go back to the other end of their enclosure and go into their hide. And then I also do behavior-based feeding with them. So if they are giving me substantial behavioral signals that they are actively hungry and hunting, I will feed them no matter how long it's been since their last meal. And they seem to regulate that on their own. So there are times when they want to eat. I fed them two or three days in a row because they're like, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I'm actively awake longer. I'm getting into ambush positions and more spots in my enclosure. I'm more active, I'm more reactive to movement, I'm hungry. And then, so I'll feed them and then they may go back to their normal habit, their normal routine and, and they won't exhibit those signs of hunger again for three, four weeks, six weeks, um, sometimes in the winter. And then they will let me know when they're hungry again and I trust them to regulate that. 
And I feel like that's working out pretty well with them. They've never not eaten when I've offered. And it's because I wait for them to show me those signs that, hey, I'm actively hunting. Look, I'm awake and it's still light. I'm hungry. I'm, look, I'm in these three different ambush spots tonight. Feed me. And, you know, by doing that, by moving around more, by extending the period of time when they're awake, they're increasing their opportunities to encounter prey. And I feel like that's probably something they would do in the wild as well. But that other behavior I described where they wake up, they move around a little, they get a drink, they go to one or two spots and sit there the rest of the night, and then they go back to bed. That's a habitual repertoire of behaviors. Like they're going to do that no matter what, no matter whether they're hungry or not, because they've done it so many times now, that's just their routine. And I have had clients ask me, well, you know, the snake's in ambush position every night. Well, is it really displaying hunger signs or is it just habitually going to that spot and sitting where it always sits there's a there's a huge difference there yeah I think the first year I got the royals I panicked in that winter period so oh my goodness and I wasted so much food and then now I only offer when like you say they're they're hungry they're sat there and sometimes it'll be two months and I haven't fed my adult males and then it, it like clicks and suddenly you're just feeding, feeding, feeding because mm -hmm. they get hungry. Right. I think that's probably, I mean, I don't know. I don't study them in situ. I don't study them in the wild. I study them under captive management. But I would venture to guess they probably have those food cycles in the wild too, or they we wouldn't see them here. Something I was going to touch upon is obviously you're, obviously we're talking about all these widespread behaviours and their habitual patterns of behaviour. If you're not keeping them in a complex enough environment, you're, you're not really going to even allow them to, to show like an ambush position. So how would one even notice these things if they were keeping in a minimalistic way that doesn't allow these things to be expressed? So if you're keeping a royal python in um, either like a viv that's only got like two hides in a water dish or in a tub or some type of very simplistic habitat that I, I know rack systems sometimes will just have substrate and a water dish and not even have a hide, you're not going to see behaviors because they don't have the opportunity to do anything but sit there or go get a drink. You know, that it's like if I put you in a room that has... Um, a place to use the bathroom and a faucet for water and a bed. Well, I'm not going to see very many behaviors from you because you don't have the opportunity to do much. But then what I might start seeing, because you have these innate urges to do species typical behaviors, is I might see you start to pace. I might see you start to exercise in your bare room, like do push-ups or sit-ups or run around the room or run in place. Or I might start to see you punch the walls or try to get out the door. And so if you watch the royals, this is what I did with the first two is, of course, I set them up identical to how the breeders had them, because I wanted to first facilitate a very smooth and transition with minimal stress. But then I also wanted to observe their behavior in the environment that they came from. So I set them up in um, a tub with water and paper towels. And, you know, they're sleeping, they're coiled up, but then nighttime comes and they're awake and I'm awake, I'm watching them all night, and it was distressing for me because I started to see them move around the tub, push on the lid, push on the sides, rub their face on everything. They knocked over their water. Just this fidgeting behavior and this behavior that obviously was showing some distress. And one of them, because the tubs were not completely clear, was striking at any movement outside of the tub. And so by the second night, I couldn't stand to watch that anymore because those were stress behaviors. They were exhibiting stereotypies, you know, the um, nose rubbing, the pushing, the pacing. And stereotypies are a way that animals try to cope when they're unable to perform the behaviors that they have natural urges to do, but they still have that innate urge and they have energy. And so then these stereotypies develop as a way to try to cope with the inability to do what it is they really want to do. So the, during the second night, I took them out of the tubs and put them in uh, chondro tubs. So if you're carpet python people or a green tree python people, you probably know what that is. It's a bigger tub, like a tote, but it has a clear front. So 
basically the front's a window. And then I just added a humid hide, a regular hide, layers of paper towel instead of just one layer and um, a perch, like a PVC perch. And so night three, when I observed them, the stereotypies were already gone. The maladaptive behavior was gone. They woke up, they moved around in a relaxed fashion. They were tongue flicking. They investigated the space in a manner that was comfortable and relaxed. They used the PVC perch. They got on top of the humid hide and hung down in an ambush position. They got in the humid hide. Um, the one that was striking at the sides of the tub, no, the striking immediately went away because he could see out. I think he was seeing motion and not knowing what it was and striking at it. it. Made a huge difference just for them to be able to see out one side. They could see me, they could see what I was doing, they could see the room. And it was like two different animals just from one night to the next, just making those very, very little changes in their living environment. And now those two, then I moved those two animals into furnished PVC enclosures and um, they're doing fine. You know, they don't exhibit stereotypies in the fully furnished enclosures. I was gonna ask because um, with mammals, when you start habitually having that stereotypical behavior ingrained, they, it carries on despite providing everything they need. But in it, the royal it, pythons, does it just go away? Not necessarily. So these were young animals, remember. You've got to remember that these animals were younger. They weren't super young. I have since added some as young as I could possibly get them to see if that made a difference in how they habituated to training and environmental complexity. But these were about four months old. So they, they didn't have a very long history of being in the Southern environment. They didn't have years and years of exhibiting these stereotypies. We do have horses here at our animal sanctuary that develop stereotypies because of how they were being kept. And even though they're no longer kept that way, they still exhibit some of the stereotypies, but those are animals that were doing that for years and years and years. And so now that has become habit. Now it's no longer just a means to cope. Now it's just habit. I've always done this. And so I continue to do that. And the part of the brain that is associated with habit is actually a different part of the brain that's associated with goal-directed behavior and higher functioning. And so once a habit develops, it's extremely difficult, the longer the habit's gone on, to break that habit. And you usually have to change the environment, change the context, make, make drastic changes with the animal or the person to get them to change habits that have been ingrained for years and years. It's funny because I think a lot of people will assume these are isolated cases, but actually what you're describing is exactly what that German paper found with their royals, was they were, they were expressing stereotypy, and then when they put them in these more complex environments, the stereotypy ceased. And I, I, I see it myself. when I, Every day that I go to work, obviously we have rack systems, it's a commercial premises. So... I mean, I, I know I showed you privately. I won't actually put this on YouTube. It's not, not my place to put that out there. But I was seeing these this nose-pressing behaviour every single day I go to work on repeat. So I don't think this is as infrequent as people think it is. I think this is probably widespread is that a lot of keepers are just ignorant to it. Well, I think they're not. I mean, how many keepers that are commercially breeding and using rack systems or simplistic enclosures because there are breeders that have animals in enclosures but they might just be very simplistic like i got one royal and he was in a four by two by 12 pvc enclosure but he just had two hides you know one on each end and a water dish which do i think that's better than a rack tub yes because the animal has more space to move around and can see out but there's still the risk of developing these stereotypies because there's very little choice. There's very little to do. So if you want to promote a choice rich life, you've got to promote an environment that's complex and has choices for them to do. And also um, control is an innate biological need because if we and other animals couldn't control our own behavior, we wouldn't survive very long. So if the animal feels like it it doesn't have control, it's gonna also develop stereotypies and attempt to cope with that lack of control. And uh, there's a difference between perceived control and actual control. I mean, unfortunately, these animals are all under captive management. 
So they have very little control. We're a hundred percent responsible for everything that happens to them. And ultimately they're under our control, but we can give them agency and agency is a sense of perceived control. It's feeling like you can operate on your environment that you can make choices on your own and make decisions as to what you're going to do throughout your day, throughout your night. And when animals have agency, they experience better welfare, better well-being. And that there's tons and tons of papers in different species from mammals to insects that, that show that. Agency optimizes well-being and that's making decisions about what they're gonna do. So if you are a snake living in a rack that's got a water dish and substrate, okay, I can sit here, I can push the substrate, I can go get a drink. But if you're living in a tub that's got perches and different levels because you've stacked maybe a, a humid hide on top of a regular hide, and now you've got a water dish and maybe you've got one type of substrate and half of it and another type of substrate in the other and it can see out, now you've already given it more things to decide to do. Okay, I can get in this hide or I could get in this moss box. I could climb up on that perch or I could lay on top of the sledge. You know, I can look out and see what's going on outside or I can get a drink. So just making slight changes improves agency because now the snake feels that it has control over its activity. And if you're a keeper that keeps a species that's primarily crepuscular or awake during the night, I don't think there are any truly nocturnal species that I can think of that, that don't come out sometimes when it's light, but there are many that are very, very active, mostly only during the night. So if you're breeding those species, you're a commercial breeder, you're keeping them in racks, you only see them during the day when the lights are on and you're there in your normal work hours from eight to four, nine to five. And then you go home all night, you have no clue what the snakes are doing. So you have no clue what they do when they're awake and active. Are they nose rubbing? Are they pushing? Are they body rubbing? Um, are they exhibiting stereotypies and other maladaptive behaviors? Are they sick, ill, or injured? If I wasn't watching some of my snakes as closely as I do, there are times when some have been, had medical issues that I would not have noticed if they were living in a rack because you have to be able to see your snake to notice if something's wrong with them or to notice if they're, whether that's a behavioral issue or a medical issue. Just to take that one step further, if you've got a rack that is opaque, not only are you only seeing them when you're there during the day, but if it's opaque, you're only seeing them when you actually open the individual tray. And if you're opening the tray as the only means to observe them, you're also interrupting their behaviour and obviously causing them to behave differently under observation. So you're effectively seeing nothing ever. Right. So there's a, there's a lot of issues with that. If they can't see out, they can't learn our behavior, which is an issue. It's not just us learning about them, but they can't see what our normal behavior is as we're doing stuff that has nothing to do with them. And if the only time we're opening the rack or the drawer is to feed them or change water, that's all they know about us is, oh, the drawer opens and I either get food or fresh water. And so they can develop a habit of striking as soon as the drawers open because the drawer opens, I get fed. The drawer opens, I get fed. The drawer opens, I get fed. The drawer. So initially that was a goal directed behavior. Oh, this drawer is open. I wonder what that means. Oh, look, there's food there. Okay, I'm going to eat. But then after they've done that 20 times, 50 times, it's no longer, they're not thinking about it. They're just doing it out of habit. Drawer opens, I strike. Drawer opens, I strike. Drawer opens, I strike. You know, because that's all they know. That's the only interaction maybe they've had with you. Because you haven't shown them that the drawer could open and they could come out. The drawer could open and they could engage in another activity. The drawer could open and they get a new enrichment item. You know, they, they don't understand that there's other options because you haven't given them any. They don't understand that other things might happen because you haven't allowed other things to happen. And so that's how some of these habits can develop that could actually be detrimental to keeper safety, especially some of the habits with striking. You know, they're striking either out of fear, anxiety, or distress, or they're striking out of some kind of habit. Like literally, if you're only interacting with them to feed them, that's going to develop into a habit. 
and the habit's going to be triggered by your presence, by the drawer opening. They're not even thinking about you or anything else. It's drawer open, strike. That is something that I, I think I came to a sort of realization on my own that that was happening. I was also thinking about like, obviously, if they've got nothing in their day to day life other than the only thing that you give them is food. Obviously, there's the whole papers and the fact that obviously the raw pythons like experience like dopamine, etc., like that. So the only rewarding experience in a rack is food, and we have this whole thing where many, many keepers will say that, that their animals will eat better in a rack. I wonder how much of that is they accept food more readily because it's the only thing that they can do that's rewarding. Whereas once they're in a rack. They they actually once they're in a vivarium, sorry, or a more complex situation in general. Uh, once they have other things to do, they are less reliant upon that food coming in to be the that one hit of reward. If that makes sense. Yeah, they can certainly find other things more reinforcing than food, but they could also not know how to eat in a viv if all they've ever eaten in is a tub. Now they associate that with eating. So if you move them into a complex habitat, they may not, they literally may not know how to eat in there because they've never had been taught to do that. So breeders that are raising these animals in racks and not giving them outside experiences outside of the tubs or giving them enrichment in the tubs are basically raising them to thrive with other rack breeders. They're not raising them and preparing them to live in a home with a family in a complex habitat because they aren't exposing them to any of the things that they're going to encounter when they move from that tub to the home. So when you move one from a breeder to your home, I recommend getting a little tub and setting it up identical to how the breeder had it, even if it's just a water dish and substrate. And then I cut a hole in it and I put it in the the um, complex viv and so the snake can come out when they feel ready on their own and then sometimes they will eat in the tub until they learn that they can eat other places and you can facilitate them learning those things by um, through target training or station training or puzzle feeding or foraging exercises but initially i just put the tub in the viv and i leave the snake alone and they can figure out, I guarantee when they wake up, they're gonna find that hole because that's what they do at night. They have observed it, they push on the lid. So they're gonna find that hole and then they're gonna stick their head out. And then it's their choice when they feel brave enough to come out and explore the habitat at large or not. And some of them do it right away and really never go back to their tub. And then others really are attached to that tub for a longer period of time and end up using the tub as their hide and then use the rest of the viv when they're awake and active during the night. And in those cases, like I, there's really no reason for me to take the tub out. If they're using it, I leave it in there. But it makes a smoother transition and the animal's not in so much shock. And it doesn't matter what the change is, whether you're going from an extremely complex environment to one that's disparate or one that's very, um, deprived, or if you're going from a deprived environment to one that's very complex, it's stressful either way. It's very stressful. Even though we know that the snakes have more agency and more behavioral opportunities in a complex habitat, if they have only ever known a tub, it's going to be extremely distressing for them to suddenly go from that to this whole world of complexity. And so, I mean, I feel it's our responsibility to try to make that transition go smoothly and minimize that transition stress. But on the flip side, if a snake or other animal's been raised in a complex situation and then they change owners and go live in Iraq, that's also gonna be extremely distressing for them. In fact, there's two studies that show um, when animals have, lived with environmental complexity or the other study was more specifically about agency when they had a lot of choice and control and then were moved to an environment that had no environmental complexity and would be termed simplistic or deprived that um, they do not do well. It 
it decreases their welfare and well-being. And sometimes they start exhibiting lethargy and depression and go off food and other things. So it's almost actually these two studies showed that that was worse than if the animal had never known the complexity or the higher sense of agency in the first place. So it's much, much worse on the animal's well-being to move them from a complex situation to a deprived one versus the other way around. Because once you know that complexity, once you've had agency, once you've had choice and control, and that's taken away, it's extremely detrimental to emotional well-being. So are you, so it's, here's, here's the thing that I, I, I think the whole picture that's happening right now and the whole culture around raw pythons that no one's really seeing the big picture and this is the kind of thing that I've noticed is that you've obviously got the very much rack-centred keepers who are have taken one raw python and shoved it in a in a, a complex environment per se and they have shocked the animal and then obviously the animal isn't eating and they're going why can't people say why can't people see that the rack is better for them i'm seeing this each time i try this clearly these people just don't realize i'm seeing this with my own eyes it does better in the rack and on the flip side you've got all the thousands of people who have never ha had a snake in a rack and it was always raised in, com in a complex environment it's always had complexity and agency and they're they'll listen to someone who keeps in rack saying this whilst there's a sat in the tree behind them or has agency and they see it climb daily. So the other side is saying, how can you say that when we all see them doing this daily? But both sides are kind of like going like this, but they don't realise that the thing that's happening to the walls to begin with in, in a really minimalistic environment is that it's causing them to be... It's almost as if the damage is being done by keeping them in the rack to begin with. But if no you know really that the that. is likely to go to a zoo or to a home with like a pet home or an education program or that snake that you're raising in the rack is likely to go to a situation where it's going to be handled, it's going to be around people, it's going to have environmental complexity and it's going to see the environment at large. You're not doing it any favors by not preparing it for that life in the beginning. If you know all the snakes ever going to go to is another breeder, I mean, it's sad and unfortunate, but you're preparing it to do well and thrive with another breeder. If you're raising it in a rack with nothing else. But if you know that your snakes are likely to go to these other situations, but you're not doing anything to prepare it to deal with or cope with those other situations, then you're putting it in a bad spot because it's gonna get into these other situations and if people don't transition it slowly and gradually, it's gonna be in shock because change is stressful. And if all it's ever known is one thing and you put it in a situation that is completely the opposite, whichever way you're doing that, it's gonna be stressful. It is going to be stressful for the animal and some will cope better than others depending on how much innate resiliency they have to change. Some are gonna cope extremely poorly and never not do well at all. Some are gonna bounce back relatively quickly and that that's all determined by genetics and resiliency and a whole bunch of other factors too. But yes, you're not, you need to raise the animal to succeed in the life that it's likely to find itself in. And if you're not sure what that is, then the best thing we can do for the animal, whether it's a horse or a dog or a snake or whatever, is prepare them for everything we could think of that they might encounter later in life. It's going to make for an animal that copes better with change and is more resilient. It's almost like a self-fulfilling cycle where in a situation which offers them no stimulation, they obviously aren't becoming more adaptable and more resilient. And then that is being observed as, well, actually... They stress when they come out of these racks, so the rack's better. So it almost feeds back into itself and it's like a false observation of the rack is more appropriate when in reality the rack, or I'll keep saying rack, but any unstimulating environment is causing the problem in the first place. Yes, you've raised the animal to succeed in that environment. You haven't raised the animal to succeed in other environments. You 
the keeper, the breeder, whoever is caring for that animal, the caretaker has raised that animal to succeed in the environment it's in. And if it goes to a different environment, it's going to have difficulty coping. It's going to have transition stress. And whether it succeeds in that new environment or not is, is now on the shoulders of the new keeper and how they facilitate that transition. And the older the animal is, the more difficult it's going to be to do that. If I got um, a couple of whorls at three, four weeks old from rats and they had no, they were transitioned within a few days. I mean, the experience they had prior to coming here was negligible compared to the experience they've had here because three weeks is nothing. Like, I don't even know if in the wild, if they would have left their little hatching area too far yet at three weeks old. So I'm taking them at this very young age with hardly any prior life experience and I'm starting to put them in environmental stimulation and they're doing great. I've also taken five and six year old royals that have known only rats and the transition is long and hard because they only ever knew that rack. That is what they were raised to succeed in. And now I'm trying to transition them into more complexity and it is distressing for them. And so I start out by keeping them very simplistically and gradually exposing them to more and more stimulation. And sometimes they, their brain has been dormant for so long. All their brain has been used for is to drink and eat and uh, breed usually. So sometimes they'll sit next to an open door for hours, days. They don't even understand that they can come out the door. And so then I have to facilitate that a little bit and show them that you can come out. And it's a long process. It's difficult because all they've ever known is the, is the tub. And they're five and six years old now, and that's a long learning history of tub life. And it's very challenging to adapt to something new. They can adapt, they are adapting, but if you're getting a pet from that kind of history, you, you've got to have no expectations and realize it could take, like one I've been working with um, going on two years now. So, I mean, I'm not, it's working, he's, He's showing more behavioral diversity. He's learning to target train. I just filmed a session with him last night, but that did not happen overnight. I mean, I think it took him seven months before he understood that he could come out the door when it was open. Seven months. Of course, time is subjective. I don't know how time works in the snake's brain. Seven months is a long time to us, but maybe that's nothing to a snake. I don't know. I mean, we can't know what's inside their head and how they perceive time. I find, because um, I've had babies that I've hatched myself and they take pretty much any kind of prey item I'll offer them. And then the adults that I've taken on, is they've got like that fixation. They, will, they can only understand one prey item, if that makes sense. Is that what you find, that you can feed variety, but some of them just don't accept it? Yeah, the older... So I have three that I took in as adults, one um, as at 23 years old, and then two at almost six years old. So now there are seven or eight. And so those two that are the similar age, one only lived in Iraq. So he was born, he was hatched at his breeders and stayed at his breeders until he came to me in, in Iraq. And he was just only ever taken out for breeding, for pairing up. So he's, you know, been a struggle to teach him things and to get him to transition. And yeah, he eats, um, his breeder said that he was eating rats, but he's eating mice here. He's never taken a rat. I don't care what they eat. You know, I just feed them whatever they prefer. Um, but yeah, he, I've offered him other things occasionally, but he only takes the mice. Now, the one that came from a situation where she's the same age as him, I got her at five or six. She went from a breeder to a college professor who kept her part of the year at his home in Iraq and part of the year at the university in a complex vivarium where students were working with her and handling her and taking her outside at, on campus. And, you know, so she had a life where she was being switched over from these different environments regularly for five years. So she came here and she's just fine. Like she was just fine in a in a four by two by two and she eats mice, rats or quail. I haven't tried chicks yet or reptilinks yet, but 
I mean, she eats what I feed her and she just goes with the flow. And if I leave the door open, she comes out. In fact, she learned how to get the sliding door off the track and let herself out. So now she's in a different viv with um, non-sliding doors. So, you know, she was the same age as this other snake that I got, but she's obviously cognitively much more complex than he is because he had exposure to basically almost nothing. And she had exposure to just lots of change and tons of stuff. I find there's a lot of non-realization that these are individual animals at different stages of complexity and learning. I see a lot of this species does this and this species does this and like broadly just describing as they do this. I see a lot of, oh, they have to eat rats and things like that. I, obviously you say you don't have any sort of issue with what you feed. Why do you think that there's a fixation on having to have this large prey item like a rat versus obviously you're experiencing, I assume you're experiencing no health issues just from feeding what, whatever you want to feed. So what is this situation we've got in the, the culture around raw pythons? I mean, that, that I don't understand. I mean, I, I don't know where that came from. Um, you know, I've only been working with the Royals for about two and a half years, but I've been concentrating a hundred percent on behavior temperament, training, everything to do with behavior. And I feed them what I feed my other snakes, which are a lot of carpet pythons, a lot of Morelia, a lot of some corn snakes. So I keep lots of different prey here. I keep rats, mice, chicks, quail, and different kinds of reptilinks and some fish. And so occasionally I'll just offer them something and they eat it or they don't. I, I offered one of my rolls a reptilink last night. It was a frog, uh, frog rabbit repti link and he took it immediately he didn't even think about it but i also think that has to do with the way we're presenting the food so i target train mine and i use the target for two ways in regard to feeding either the target signals food and food is never coming if you don't see this target so at no other time when i'm around you when stuff's happening are you getting fed if this target is not here so the target signals food and when they learn that they see the tar target and then they assume food and that's that habit. So whatever you put in front of the target, then they're just going to take because they've developed that habit of target food, target food, target food. And if that's all you want to use it for, fine. I, most of my snakes, I wean off of that and I start using it for other training where now the target doesn't mean food. The target means you have an opportunity to earn reinforcement based on performing some other behavior first. And that reinforcement might be food, it might be exercise time, it might be one of these other things. But when I'm using the target with food, they know that target means food. So they automatically, when they see the target, start to change their body posture. They start to get in that strike position, that ambush position, they get tense. You can tell that it's triggered a feeding response to see it. So as soon as I put the prey there, they're taking whatever's there without thinking and i i'm quite sure i've gotten several of them to eat items maybe they wouldn't normally have eaten by presenting it in that way because they're not thinking about it they're just snatching it and taking it now some that are quite discerning will take it and then you can tell they taste it or smell it and realize it's weird and they drop it sometimes though they just take it and eat it because they've already that response has already been triggered and I have it and it's going down. So obviously like they'll take it based upon that habit you've created with target training. But obviously like a, a, a I have people say they feed their, their royals at work like a large rat. Obviously a mouse is not the same size as a large rat. So when you feed, do you just kind of, how I personally do it is I wait, I'll feed them something, wait and then watch if they orient towards me again for more. And I'll just give them food until they stop. And that's their feeding session, if you will, done until next time I feed. Is that the kind of way that you approach the smaller prey items for oils? Um, yeah, I kind of know how much I think that they should have based on their body condition and weight and how much exercise they're getting. So if I know that they could eat one mouse or one rat that's a certain size, let's just say 50 grams but I want to do two or three tar two training sessions, then I'll just 
feed them two things that are 25 grams each. Or let's say that I have a snake big enough to eat a large rat, but they don't like rats and they'll eat quail or they'll eat mice. Then I just add up the amount of mice or quail that I need to feed to equal the nutritional content in that rat and I feed them that. You can also, like I have some that have a few medical conditions here that can only eat small prey items. So I inject those prey with um, critical care carnivore, which is a high calorie carnivore diet. It's a liquid diet. And um, that's gonna add more calories to the very tiny prey. So I suppose if you only wanted to feed one prey item, your royal's eating a mouse and not a rat, you could inject it with critical care carnivore. And then you're, you're adding more calories to the smaller food item. And I have checked with my veterinarian about feeding multiple prey, prey items at once, feeding uh, varied prey items, like in one session, like, oh, I, I feed a reptilink and a rat, like TC um, last night ate two reptilinks and a mouse. And she, she says there shouldn't be any problem with that at all, as long as you're not overfeeding. And by overfeeding, I mean feeding too frequently or feeding too much food at once. So the obsession that a lot of Regis keepers have with, oh, you can only feed the one prey item, um, is not based in a sort of reality, really. I've worked with three vets with my reptiles, and none of them have said that that's an issue because it's, it's the quantity of the meal in grams or however you're weighing it. It's the size that they can accommodate and the caloric content that they should have that's safe, that's not going to make them obese or make them be underweight. It's not, it doesn't matter how you divide that up. If it's in one, one piece of meat or three pieces of meat, they're still getting the same weight of food and they're still mm -hmm. getting the same nutritional content. And in fact, if it's split up, it's likely easier to digest because of the way their digestive system works. It has to get through all of that integument, all of that fur and skin to the good stuff that it can actually use. And it's gonna be easier to do that with smaller multiple items than one big one. Or even if it's got like, um, sometimes they tear open and that's not a big deal because now you've already helped them a little bit get to the good stuff inside. I mean, it's a lot of work for them to, um, digest they can't digest and utilize the nutrients from skin and hair but they have to get through that to get to the internal organs and the bones and so that's a lot of work for their digestive system i think the only time i've thought it was justified is when they are the, in that baby stage and instead of feeding um lots of little prey items that are still not weaned you're feeding them that one whole prey item but apart from that i just feed multiple prey items sometimes I vary it. I mean, sometimes they get one thing, sometimes they get three or four. It just depends on, because for me, feeding is an opportunity to interact with them in some mm -hmm. beneficial way. So during feeding time is when I do target training, station training, foraging exercises, puzzle feeding. I give them a food acquisition challenge when they're eating. It's not just, here's your food, I'm feeding you. Because in the wild, they have to work to find their food. They have to leave their den, unless they're lucky enough to have something wander in. But they have to physically leave their den and move around and look for food and find spots where they know that if they get an ambush position here, it's likely prey is going to come by. And they have to remember those locations and go back to them time and time again. And then if those locations dry up, they need to know how to move and find new locations so that they're having to follow scent trails and clues as to where the food is. They're not just sitting and waiting for food to come to them or they would die. I mean, I'm sure it's rare. I'm sure food does sometimes wander into wherever they're resting, but that's not going to be a normal occurrence. They're going to have to physically go out and move around and use their physical abilities and their cognitive abilities to locate food. So when I feed them here, I try to make them do that. I, I set up some kind of a food acquisition challenge and they engage in that. And you see their behavior change and you see that they're actively engaged in whatever their species typical hunting behavior is. I just wanted to ask, because um, with my royals, I have to heat the head to get them anywhere interested with a lot of them. 
How do you include that when you're trying to puzzle feed? Is there like a transition you can do or just some won't? You know, mine eat the, I'm trying to think if I have any. I don't think I have any. So there probably is a, an inadvertent transition because when I first start training them, they get the food pretty quickly, right? I'm just pairing a target with food. So I'm, I'm just showing the target and pairing it with food initially. And so they're getting the food as soon as I've warmed it. So initially it probably is still very warm. And then, you know, I transition to showing the target, oh, they orient towards it, then they get the food. So that's still only a few seconds. And then the same with any station training or puzzle feeding, you're gonna make it super easy at first. Like the puzzle's just a bowl that you put the food in or the puzzle's just an open box you put the. So they're gonna find it while it's still warm. But then as time goes on, that prey is gonna cool to room temperature and which here at room temperature, I, I like to keep the house warm is like 78 to 80 degrees. So it's still not that cold. But by that time they've developed the routine, the habit, they understand what the activity is. So they know that when they get to that item, it's food and I haven't had the heat be an issue. But you're right, if I think about it, there's been that gradual transition to initially they probably were eating it when it was very warm. But by the time we're getting to complex activities, the, the food temperature doesn't matter anymore because they're just happy that they completed the challenge and they've got the food and they're gonna eat it. That's really interesting, yeah. Have you found there's a difference between morphs? Because um, I've got a champagne, which apparently are known to be skittish and she definitely is more nervous than any of the other ones that I've got. You know, I didn't realize when I first um, started studying the Royals behavior that there were certain health issues linked to certain morphs. And I have since learned this. And I believe champagne is one that can have some neurologic issues along with spider. Um, I think the hidden gene Woma, the super cinnamon can have some issues, the super black pastel. I didn't know any of that when I first started acquiring them, I, I do now. Um, but sort of anecdotally, and I didn't intend to study this and I haven't been documenting it, the darker colors just seem to interact with me more and be um, faster learners and just be able to do more cognitively complex tasks like quicker and sooner and on a more regular basis like than some of the others that are lighter colored and maybe that's just coincidence. Maybe it's just the ones here. There are other factors that might contribute to, to that like the age that I acquired them. Like I have these two piebald ones that are um, you know white and another color and I have one that's all white. That's a, what is he? A super fire and he's all white. And they're like the ones that are the most fearful, most shy interact the least, take, have taken a really long time to train and get to do, do some of these challenges. Um, where some of like the normals, the blackheads, the black pastels, um, it seems like they pick it up quickly. But then I also have to remind myself that I got those darker ones when they were younger. And I, I guess more than color or more, if I'm noticing that there's a huge difference at what age you get the animal. So the ones I've gotten at less than four months old have adapted so quickly and learned so quickly and are engaging in challenging activities so quickly and confidently versus the ones I've gotten over four months old and over a year old, it's even slower. That's really interesting. In domestic animals, mineralism, so that dark pigment is linked to um, tameness or tolerance towards people. I wonder if that's something that maybe is happening in the reptiles. You know, that is something, like I said, that I never intended to study and I haven't been keeping data on. I just know that when I look back at the recent videos that I've made in this last year, I saw like the brown snakes, the black snakes, the ones with dark colors. Um, the, it's not the white ones and the piebald ones that I'm holding in the videos or having do activities because they're the ones that are least apt to engage in them. And again, that could just be coincidental because those animals, to be fair, were all a little bit older when I got them. But it would be interesting to know if there were any behavior links to um, the morphology, to the color, to the, to the pattern. Um, it's possible because that's been theorized in dogs and horses. And I actually think there's some studies about that. I know that 
High baldism is linked to domestication in dogs and horses. So you don't see black and white horses and black and white wolves, you know, in the wild, you see solid colored animals. But then once they undergo that domestication process, you start getting white spots and white patches. And we like that visually, so we breed more of those. Um, it, would be an it would be interesting for somebody to look into that, but it would mean that you would have to be able to document the genetics, the color and pattern genetics of the royals and know what they carry. And then you would have to do a whole battery of behavioral testing to see if certain behaviors tended to be linked to certain colors or patterns. I mean, that would be a big, complicated project, but certainly would be interesting. I just want to point out Oksana literally climbing on the ropes behind Ellie right now as, we, as we're talking about com complex behaviors and whatnot. But they don't climb. <laughs> My hog knows snake climbs. I mean, snakes have to be able to navigate varied terrain in the wild or they wouldn't be able to survive. Does that mean they're all semi-arboreal? No, it means they all climb. I mean, they're all capable of climbing and of traversing varied ground terrain, rocks, crevices. I mean, they don't just live in the wild on a flat surface. So they have to be able to go up and down. So I have a, a plains hog no snake and you know, when she's super hungry, she gets up on her PVC perch and she hangs down, which led me to wonder if reptiles could um, acquire learned behaviors through social learning, which is where one animal watches another and sees the outcome of their behavior and then mimics or copies that behavior to try to get the same outcome. And it turns out they can. There's been a, at least one paper that I found, I think it was it in bearded dragons or green iguanas, bearded dragons, I think. Yeah, yeah I know the paper. Where, where one was taught to open a sliding door and the others just watched. And then all of them knew how to open the sliding door. I, I, that's the paper I'm thinking of. It was something like that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have wondered, well, my hog no snake, when she's super hungry, she gets up on this PVC perch and hangs down. Has she seen me, the other snakes do that and give food? Um, but my point there is they all will climb, even if they're mostly terrestrial or even fossorial snakes, like they have to climb up out of the ground sometime. We literally, when we first put my fossorial species, the caliber pythons, the first night, the first thing they were doing, they were climbing. <laughs> we were like, ah, yes. <laughs> well, also, it, it may be a novel behavior for some and exciting. Yeah. You know, because accomplishing novel tasks and succeeding at that gives the animals, gives people reinforcement. Like um, neurochemicals are released that make us feel good when we accomplish things or try new things. And it's the same with animals. So if that experience wasn't frightening, it can be beneficial, it can be rewarding. So there's good stress, tolerable stress and bad stress. And good stress are those things that are exciting you know, they're challenging and hard, but they're kind of fun and exciting and, and they might be difficult, but once we've done it, we feel good about it. And it's the same for animals. Um, tolerable stress is distressing and challenging, but animals are able to cope with it and overcome. And then they're usually more resilient for it. And then toxic stress is just always bad. Toxic stress is that level of distress that an animal or person reaches where they're unable to cope with it, they're unable to recover, and it causes permanent long-term detriment to the organism. I just want to bring this back a second. So we're talking, all, I think all three of us have gone down the rabbit hole already. We're talking about things like we're so casual to us. But let's just bring it back to the point where obviously there's a lot of keepers of raw pythons that don't realise that complex learning is a thing or even learning is a thing or the fact that you can train them. Can we just go over the point that yes, they are able to learn and yes, you can train them? Yes. If snakes couldn't learn, they would not have survived 100 million years on this planet evolving and continuing to survive. Learning occurs because experiences happen and the snakes or whatever organism it is learns from that experience. So everything every behavior the snake does has a consequence. And that consequence is either beneficial to the animal or not beneficial to the animal. And if it's not beneficial to the animal and they're still alive, then they're not gonna repeat that behavior. 
But if the consequence was beneficial, it resulted in a finding a mate, it resulted in finding water, it resulted in finding food, it resulted in finding shelter, it resulted in escaping predation, then they're going to repeat that behavior that worked for them. That's learning. That is literally what learning is. So if they were unable to learn, then they just wouldn't be able to survive. And that goes with every organism. And then on top of that, you bring the animals into captivity and we see that they can adapt to captive management. We see that they can learn to live with humans. And again, if they weren't learning, they wouldn't be able to adapt to the things that we expect of them under captive management. And then when we formally try to train them using operant conditioning, it works. You know, and, and there was a study as that Burmese Python study. I was so happy to find that several years ago because I was, I was training snakes and I'm like, this is working really well. I can't believe no one's done this. And then I found that study where wild Burmese pythons had been trained to push a lighted button, but only when it was lit up in order to gain access to food, that's operant conditioning. And I thought, well, great. Other people have done this. And so it works so well not only with snakes, but all animals. I mean, that's how we all learn. It's how zoo animals learn. learn. It's how our domestic animals learn. Um, that we can use operant conditioning to modify behavior under captive management and teach them to do things we would like them to do. And it works really well because we see that it works. It, we do it and it happens. But then when you start to look at some of the research into the reptile brains, vertebrate brains, um, brains of birds, we see that they have all of the necessary parts neurologically and neurochemically to learn and do the behaviors we're asking them to do. So there's all of these components that you can look at and say they survive in the wild, they learn under captive management, and they have the necessary brain components um, and neurochemicals in order to do this. And so you put all that together and it's obvious to me that they can learn. I don't know why someone would think that they couldn't learn. Well, it's like if you have um, a snake with a strong feeding response in a viv, a lot of people will recommend tap training where you're tapping them with the hook before you're touching them and that lets them know that they're not being fed. So it's quite commonly accepted that we can train them, just no one has ever linked that we can train them for the snake's benefit. It's always been for our own, if that makes sense. Right. And that type of traditional training. So first of all, keepers have taught the snake to have that feeding response. I mean, that's, that's on us. Like if the snake has an, a heightened feeding response in a viv, we have set that up to occur. Like we're the cause of that. So whatever we have done during our interactions with them has, has facilitated them learning that behavior and then that behavior becoming habit. So we controlled that. And then it's a lot more difficult for animals to learn that a behavior means something's not gonna happen than a behavior means something is gonna happen. So the tap training, people think this, the snakes understand this means I'm not getting fed, but what it probably means to the snake is I'm gonna get picked up now or that something else is going to happen because they're gonna remember the things that occur versus what's not, they're not gonna be thinking, oh, I'm not getting fed now. If you tap them with the hook and pick them up, they're gonna think, oh, the hook means I'm gonna get picked up. And it's what I use as a no choice cue. I just use a snake hook or a PVC perch as a no choice cue. So if I get you with the hook, it means I'm going to pick you up and it means you can't opt out because in most of the other things I do, the snake always has the opportunity to opt out. And so I never use a hook with anything else. Um, the hook means you're going to get picked up. So the snake's not taken by surprise. The snake knows exactly what's going to happen and it makes the whole thing go smoother because they know what's going to happen. You've just told them Everything goes a lot better if I tell you I'm going to do something to you than if I surprise you with it. If I tell you I'm going to give you this vaccination, that's going to go a lot better for both of us than if I just walk up to you and jab you in the arm with a needle. So if you can communicate to your snake what is going to happen, even if it's something bad or even if it's something they might not find pleasurable, the fact that you've let them know it's going to happen is going to already bring the stress level down. 
So that's what I use the hook for, for those rare occasions when the snake has no choice. And that might be, hey, we have a vet appointment and you, you happen to not be in your hide with the bottom and you're not awake and you're not shifting out, but we have to go. Usually it's when they're out roaming and they haven't gone into their shift to go back or they're not wanting to target back. Like they don't want to get put away, but I have to put them away. And so that's when I'll use a snake hook but I don't do it very often, but they learn that is the no choice cue because in all other situations, they can opt out. If they don't feel like target training today, like I have snakes that know very complex behaviors and can target out of their viv onto a station position hold. But there may be someday when they're like, you know what, I'm I just don't feel like doing that. And if they indicate that to me, that's fine. I still feed them. And what I'll do in those cases is just pair the target with food and feed them. So I'm still reinforcing the target as a training tool, but I'm not making them do the behavior because they opted out. You know, there are days when we don't feel like going to work or school, or we don't feel like getting out of bed. And I'm not going to blame the animals for having days like that. And we should be withholding food or other reinforcers because of that, but I still at the very least pair it with the target. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes they opt out and they're like, no, I don't feel like it today. But then for those occasions when they can't opt out, that's when I use the hook and they know that, oh, if she, if she gets me with the hook, I'm getting picked up, but at least they're not taken by surprise. That's cool. Cause um, if they can opt out, that means that the behavior that you're doing is somehow rewarding other than the food, if that makes sense. Right. So I have many snakes well, and I had to learn this in the beginning, like what's it been four or five years ago, the very first snake I target trained and it was to manage her because she was so reactive and fearful. And I was just happy as could be that she learned how to shift out and wait on a station and shift back. And I'm like, if you never learn another thing, you just changed my life because just that I could clean her enclosure. I could do what I needed to. She's safely eating and then she's shifting back. Well, one time I targeted her out, she took the food and she dropped it and she started roaming around the room. And that is when she taught me that she reached a point in her life where she found freedom in that moment, more reinforcing than food. And now, even though she's still not a snake that, that likes touch or handling, she'll come out and explore the room. She'll get right next to me. She's very confident now and does find that freedom reinforcing but she isn't one that likes to be touched or handled. And I get people that ask me about that because yes, I would prefer they all can accept or tolerate some touch and handling if we have to medicate them or have an emergency. So I try to work up to that throughout their lifetime, but some of them just remain always averse to that. And in the ones that are just so averse to touch and handling that it causes so much distress, that training them to accept it's not worth the stress it's causing them, I just let them be. Because all of those ones are target trained. I, I don't have any difficulty managing them. They'll come out, they'll shift, they'll go back in. You know, I don't have management issues. It's just that they don't wanna be touched. And so in the case of if they needed the, the vet or medication or an emergency happened, then they would get that no choice signal and I would just handle them and we keep that totally separate from positive reinforcement training. Obviously, a while ago, we did a collaboration project talking about brain structure changes in relation to enrichment and complexity and reinforcement. Obviously, people might be finding this podcast episode for the first time or listening to it on the Animals at Home Network. Can we just go over the like hippocampus and amygdala and the neural pathways and the brain structure of raw pythons in relation to environmental pressures and interactions? Snakes and other reptiles have the same or homologous brain structures and structures in their central nervous system as all other vertebrates. And vertebrates are animals that have a spinal column and a brain. So that's gonna be mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds. Those are vertebrates. So that's us, horses, dogs, snakes, lizards, frogs, you know, anything with a spinal column and a brain has a, a central nervous system. And while some of the neurochemicals are exactly the same, others are homologous, which means they're a slightly different neurochemical, but they serve the same function as our neurochemicals. 
snakes brains though do have dopamine they have all of the same neurochemicals that we use for um learning and and memory and uh, fear acquisition and resiliency building and they have the capability physiologically to do all of those same things we can um the prefrontal cortex or the neocortex in mammals snakes and other reptiles and birds don't have that exact same piece of anatomy but they have something called a dorsal ventricular ridge and researchers think that that serves the same function in those animals as the neocortex in humans and we i, I feel like people realize how smart birds are because it's all over social media always birds doing these fantastically intelligent things sometimes things I don't think I could do like caching their food all over the place. I could never remember where I left all that food. And so researchers think the dorsal ventricular ridge is performing those higher brain functions that our neocortex performs. And snakes and other reptiles have that piece of anatomy as well. So there's no reason physiologically or neurologically to believe that snakes and other reptiles can't have higher cognition similar or the same that other vertebrates can have. And when I say higher cognition, I mean things like learning, um, resiliency building, problem solving, all those kinds of things. I don't mean they can do math, maybe they can. I guess birds can do math, but I'm, I'm just saying that they have the cognitive ability that they need in order to survive in the world they've adapted to survive in. And they're gonna use those cognitive abilities under captive management in some way as well. Those cognitive abilities that they use to locate resources and av avoid predation in the wild aren't just gonna go away because we put them in a cage. And so, so I feel like it's our duty to give them activities to do, to stimulate those brain areas and to have an outlet for those innate urges that they're gonna have to move around, to seek resources, you know, to climb or to burrow or to swim. And seeking is highly reinforcing for people and other animals. And that does involve dopamine and the release of certain neurochemicals. So when the neural pathways atrophy through lack of use, is that because of lack of stimulation? Yeah, so the way that neurons neurons are what send signals to the brain and to other parts of the body and all those neural pathways need to be active in order for our brain to tell our arms and legs what to do and then our senses send neurochemical signals to our brain to tell our brain you just touch something hot or you smell food or hey there's a potential mate over there if those pathways are not being used, then the synapses, which connect these neurons together, atrophy and just fall away. And so now you don't have maybe anything firing between, um, let's say, the part of the brain that would regulate climbing or is associated with climbing and the ability to climb. So you could have a tree in front of a snake and they don't know what to do with it because that neural pathway is kaput. And, it's, and unfortunately what happens sometimes under captive management when they don't have enough environmental complexity and stimulation, when they don't have outlets for this higher functioning, um, that all that's firing are those fear centers. And the amygdala is highly involved with fear learning and fear acquisition. And the hippocampus is highly involved with suppressing that and regulating that. But what happens if you aren't stimulating the hippocampus to do problem solving and to cognitively um, think about tasks and giving the brain things to do, then it is sitting there atrophying and those synapses aren't firing. And the ones that are firing constantly are the ones in the amygdala that are telling the animal, I'm afraid. And you can acquire a generalized fear or reactivity now of everything. So now the animal's fearful out of context. So maybe initially they were afraid when they should have been. It was a legitimate, oh man, this person opened the drawer and startled me and it scared me and that's appropriate. 
but now because that's the only interaction they're having, it's the only activity they get, they're not getting to use the other brain areas. The fear center is just going crazy. And now they're generalizing that fear to everything. So now it's not just when the drawer opens, it's when they get taken out. It's when they get taken to the vet. It's when something else happens because the most active part of the brain are the synapses that are involved in fear or reactivity. And that's just an example. You know, if you give the snake things to do constantly where they're constantly climbing or swimming or burrowing or um, figuring out how to get out of their enclosure, those are the synapses that are firing all the time. And those are the ones that are continued to grow and build branches. And the ones um, involved in fear acquisition and fear learning aren't getting utilized. And so those are the ones that are going to become diminished. So the more choice rich life an animal has, the more resiliency they build, the more challenging experiences that they can encounter in their lifetime and be successful at, the more confident the animal is going to be and the less overall fearful they're going to be. And the opposite, of course, happens if you don't give them those opportunities, because all they have to do is think about sitting in that box and how scared of everything they are. And cognitive bias also impacts animals. So cognitive bias is, do you have a more pessimistic or optimistic outlook on the world? So if I put a snake in a room with lots to do, is the snake gonna ask itself, what's gonna happen to me here? What can this environment do to me? Or is the snake going to ask itself, oh, what can I do in this environment? I wonder what will happen if I go climb on this. I wonder what will happen if I push this with my nose. I wonder what will happen if I get in that water. I wonder what will happen if I eat this. That's an example of a pessimistic outlook or an optimistic one right from the get-go. And we can foster that by the way that we raise the animals. You can foster a more optimistic outlook, which is that animal that's going to be placed in a room or that human that's going to be placed in a new environment and think, oh, I wonder what I can do here versus, oh my gosh, I wonder what's going to happen to me here. So if it's all about how the animal's raised and how they've been worked with to create and foster this level of adaptability and this outlook, what should we be looking for in a breeder? What is the ideal breeder? What should we be asking for in a breeder before we buy? It's not 100% how they're raised in an environment. It's a huge part of it, but there's also going to be genetics involved, epigenetics involved, and stress during development. So um, with mammals, it would be any stress that the mother has undergone when the animals are still in utero, and then any stress during development as those animals are growing up. So with reptiles, it's going to be, well, with oviparous reptiles, it's going to be were those eggs, was the mother severely stressed somehow when those eggs were developing? And when the eggs are incubating, are those eggs undergoing some kind of unusual stress or are they in optimal conditions? All of those things can affect how the babies turn out innately when they hatch. So when we're born, when animals hatch, we have this innate temperament that we start out with. And it can be extremely shy or extremely fearful or somewhere in between. It can be really proactive, like, oh, I wonder what I can do here or, or reactive, like, oh my gosh, is that going to hurt me? Oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me here or somewhere in the middle. But you can take that innate temperament and you can build on that through experience and learning. And we can foster that through training and enrichment. And so breeders should be, if, if the animals are intended to be pets or educational animals or zoo animals where they're gonna interact a lot with people, you should be choosing to reproduce the animals that have the best temperaments, <clears throat> most bold nature, outgoing personalities and exhibit the least amount of fear when exposed to novelty. So you can help yourself out there by trying to reproduce animals that just have this innate bolder temperament or proactive personality. <clears throat> and then as you're raising them, the more things that you can expose them to from an early on, the more resiliency they're going to build, the more they're going to get used to. And then when they go to that new home, they're not going to be as shocked about everything. So if you know it's going to a pet home and people are going to be walking around in front of a glass viv, then put it in an environment where it can see you walking around in your snake room. 
if you know that people are going to put tons of furnishings in there, start giving it one or two novel items at a time to start getting used to these foreign objects in their space. Let it out of the tub and let it roam around the room. Um, use considerate handling with it. If you know it's going to go to a family with kids, you know they're going to want to hold it. So start working on considerate handling from the beginning. And at any point where the snake's exhibiting fear, you should stop and back off and then try again at a lower threshold. But you can do these things from the get-go to prepare the snake for the life it's going to have versus doing nothing, exposing it to nothing, not worrying about the temperament of the parents, but I like these two colors the best, so I'm gonna breed them. And it doesn't matter that all of their offspring are always highly reactive and fearful and um, you know known for biting or hiding a lot, I don't know. I mean, that's not an animal I would breed. <laughs> So there are all these things that could be done on the breeder's end to, I don't want to say 100% ensure success, but give the animals an opportunity to be as successful as they can be in the environments they're likely to end up. I see an issue with it, not with doing that. I just see an issue with the larger culture uh, at large where that isn't necessarily valued against phenotypes. So if you were to go out and embark on this project and where I'm going to produce incredibly amazing pet royal pythons, I don't think the, the hobby or industry, whatever you want to call it, is at a stage where it values it enough for that actually to take place. I feel like it's still valuing the wrong things in many aspects. I the like industry you... as I see it, and I came into it as an animal trainer for years and years already in this field. And I just started adding snakes to the animals I was working with. So I came into this and I absolutely noticed right off that it is a, an industry or a community or whatever you want to call it, but is not putting the animals first. Like absolutely <clears throat> the well being of the animals is not what breeders are putting first. <clears throat> Many pet keepers, yes. But if a breeder was putting the well-being of the animals first, then they would care what happens to them after they leave their facility. They would care where the animal ends up. They would care if the animal lives to be two or 20. You know, they would care if the animal was distressed or not by the transition of leaving their facility and going somewhere else. And if they cared about that, then they would do things to prepare it as best as they can for that new life that they're going to have. But that's not what I see for the most part. I see a few breeders who do it inadvertently, don't realize they're doing it. Like um, I have this Royal Boba Fett. He's a little brown, brown Royal. He's like a, like a cinnamon genetic stripe, but he's just basically this really gorgeous brown snake. He's super outgoing, like super bold and super confident. And he's one of those outliers. And I'm like, wow. And his breeders told me from the beginning that they open the tubs when they clean and leave them open. And then the snakes, some of them come out, you know, some of them sit on the edges and that that one, they always had to keep an eye on because he would leave the tub and roam around and they had to keep track of him. Well, so they were inadvertently giving him and their snakes the opportunity to see what's going on as the humans are working, to see what's going on in the room, to explore the room. And when they told me about that one, I said, yeah, I want that one. And that has rung true here. Like he's really outgoing. So that breeder is inadvertently doing things that are likely to make a lot of their animals more successful as pets than a breeder that doesn't do that. Or, you know, I don't know if some of them don't take them out to clean or put them in another tub to clean or how that works out or holds them to clean. But when you let them roam around on their own and make their own decisions about what to do while you're cleaning, that's different than holding them or different than putting them in another tub. And then there are a, a few breeders out there that are trying on purpose to give the hatchlings enrichment and stimulation and expose them to things they're likely to encounter in a pet home. And I have a couple of clients who have royal pythons from this one particular breeder and they're just so happy with them because he started target training them before he sold them. They, they had enriched tubs and they got exercise time out of the enclosures in exercise spaces and tents. And so my two um, clients that have snakes from him, they're like, these are the best snakes. I'm so happy with them. 
And they have snakes from other breeders that they never see, that are shy, that don't engage, that are fearful. So it's, it's like night and day if you take the time to set these animals up for success versus not caring. Yeah. Who is that? I thought we should like praise oh, the people doing it right. Yeah. So Bob Bledsoe with Green Room Pythons. I knew um, it was going to be just, Well, because he's a small, small scale breeder right now, but he does a lot with his snakes that he has. You know, um, he does keep some of them in tubs, but they're, they're highly enriched. Like they, they literally have everything in it that we have in a vid. They just don't have the overhead lighting and stuff, you know, but he's got like little perches in there for him, different highs, different levels, substrate. He puts novel, uh, he trades novel objects in and out of there for them to do. And then he, he lets them out basically every day. He opens the tubs and the ones that want to come out can come out and he has exercise ladders and ropes and tents set up for them. And it's great. And, you know, I know two people who have some of his, who have his hatchlings and they love those snakes. It's almost like the new age breeder compared to, to, to new school versus old school. Well, for animals going to a pet home, pet homes have certain expectations of their animals and they're highly disappointed when they get this beautiful animal and it doesn't meet their expectations. And it's another reason why I try to counsel a lot of people before they get the snake and I have them write down what are your expectations of this animal what in your ideal mind does your life with the snake look like because you might be looking at the wrong species <laughs> because I had one client that wanted a rainbow boa and like I want a rainbow boa I put a deposit on one they're so beautiful and I had this person make the list and uh, nothing on the list matched with personality and temperament and natural history of a rainbow boa. And I'm like, this is not, you are going to be, you're not going to be happy with your snake because you're, it's, you're going to be disappointed. It's not going to do any of these things you envision it doing with you. And so we went through other species. They picked out a different species and they're a hundred percent super, super happy with the snake they got. So this is really important that people think about is a royal python right for you you might look out and get one that's awake like earlier than you go to bed but it's it's not a guarantee unless you've worked with the breeder ahead of time and you've asked about the routine and the activity level and what they've been exposed to and if you get a breeder that tells you anything about behavior at all or is willing to do some little temperament checks for you that's fantastic because many will just tell you, I don't pay attention to that. I couldn't tell you that. And I'm not going to do that. You either want this snake or not. And then you're just, it's like a crapshoot, the Russian roulette. You're just taking a chance. If you pick it out solely on how it looks, you're just taking a chance on what its personality is going to be like. And you might be really super pleased or you might be super disappointed. And then what happens is people want to rehome the snake. Or they want to keep getting more snakes because they just know this next one's going to, you know, be the one that fits their needs. But you, I really feel like people need to do research into the species and ask the breeder about behavior and temperament of the parents and the hatchlings and any siblings from previous clutches before you make that decision to randomly get one because you could be sorely disappointed. And if that's your only snake, that's really sad. And then that's when people want to rehome them and get a different one. I wish people when I'm selling would come to me and ask what the personality was because I've had people inquire and be like I want this snake for my children I'm like wrong one of the clutch not that one and I try and steer them to that actually this one's really confident and this one's always out and this one's great but a lot the first initial interaction always is this one's the pretty one like that's not the most important thing it isn't and you know, I look at behavior first. So I have some snakes here that I would not have picked out based on how they look. But when I found out how their personality was, I was like, uh, yeah, that one, because I think it would work well with this project I'm doing or this program. And then it's so funny. You really end up liking that snake so much that now you like that color. Now, when I see other snakes, that color, I'm like, oh, I love that color. And I didn't even like it before. <laughs> but, but the snake's personality was so good that the the way it looked grew on me. It almost makes you want to, because uh, obviously Ellie's already breeding, but it makes me want to breed and then try and 
I want to say market, but try and express how you're trying to do things differently so that people can see the the, the inherent value that you're trying to propose. There's but a I, value not only for the consumer, but also for the snakes. Because if that snake is prepared for a life as a family pet or an education animal or as a zoo animal, that snake is going to experience better well-being because it was prepared for that ahead of time than if it was just coldly thrown into that environment. So there are benefits not only from the perspective of the person who has the animal, but also from the snake's perspective. There are benefits all the way around. The pessimistic part of me just makes me think that like other breeders are going to be like, that they're just chatting rubbish. They're just trying to pull a fast one on you, blah, 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 blah. But I, I think that if more people start doing that um, and could show that it's being done, also, like in video format, you show something being trained. But aren't people going to want the animal that's already being shown that it is being trained? And I would absolutely pay more for that animal personally, and I would expect consumers to pay more, and I would expect that breeders would charge more because they're spending more time and effort with that animal. I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, I've paid breeders to start target training snakes before they could get shipped. I'm like, please do this. I'll pay you extra because that's worth it to me. And it benefits the snake in the long run to have that training as early on as possible before it gets here. I literally get messages being like, I can get a snake just like this, 50 pounds cheaper somewhere else. I'm like, yeah, but doesn't necessarily mean it's having the same start. <laughs> Like they all of my babies have enriched tubs. They started on feeding lots of different items. They get free time. I can tell you about the personality. I can tell you about their parents' personality, but that's not what's important sometimes, I guess. Not to other people anyway. It should be important, especially if you're a family and that's gonna be your only snake or one of only a couple snakes, because you know your kids are going to want to see it, hold it. Their friends are going to want to, even if you don't have kids and you're an adult, what does everybody want to do? I want to hold my snake. I want to show my snake to my friends, you know, and that's a want, not a need. And, and that's another thing that we don't think about when we're interacting with our snakes and other animals, we have a lot of wants that are not needs. And we need to differentiate that. Um, because I get, people that come to me for behavior consulting and I'll ask what precipitated the behavior and they'll say, well, um, you know, I was trying to change the water. I, I was trying to spot clean and it scared the snake and it hissed at me or it bit me or it went into hiding and now it's hiding all the time. Well, those were things you wanted to do, but they weren't necessarily things that needed to be done right then. Like you could have waited for a more opportune time that wouldn't frighten the animal to change the water or spot clean. And certainly wanting to hold your snake and wanting to show your snake to your friends, that's a want, that's not a need. And we have to weigh that and take that into account because these are living things with individual thoughts and, and feelings. And it's not fair to just think that it, we're free to do with them as we please. You know, going to the vet because something's wrong with the snake is a need. Evacuating because fire or flood or something is a need. I need to get you out. Here's the no choice signal. We're going versus, oh, you know, I've got people visiting that really want to hold a snake. But if I go to the viv and they're not awake and at the door, I'm not going to make them come out because that's not a need. But many of them if they find interactions with you or the environment reinforcing, they come out more often than you would think. Like Rodney, our bull snake, pretty much if someone wants to see a snake, I could walk up and open her viv and she'll come out 90% of the time. Unless she's in shed, if she hears that door open or sees it open, she comes out because she finds things that happen to her when she's out reinforcing. And she knows it's not always food. Sometimes it's just exploring. Sometimes she gets held. Sometimes we make a video, but enough good stuff happens that she wants to come out. So when you first got into Regis, were you expecting the level of activity that you see from what you had heard about Regis in general, or have they surprised you? 
So I came into this with no expectations because they weren't a species at that time I was attracted to. I love Australian pythons. I have a lot of carpet pythons and brettles pythons and I love them. So it wasn't a species that I was attracted to or had any preconceived feelings about one way or another. So I literally wanted to, but I kept hearing all these things from all these people that were so, their beliefs were so disparate, like they can't both be true. So I wanted to just come into this with a clean slate, no expectations. Like I didn't care what the snakes did or what they showed me. I just wanted to look at them and give them the opportunity to show me their preferences. And it was strictly going to be a preference test, tub or vivarium. And um, I did that here by taking their tub and cutting a hole in it and putting it in the vivarium, but leaving their tub always with water, always with su clean substrate. Like they never literally would have to leave their tub if they didn't choose to, but they all chose to. I mean, the two original ones chose to right away. In fact, they left the tub and one of them uses it um, as a toilet. Like that's like, I never have to clean her viv. Like she, I just clean the tub because that's where she goes and eliminates, which is super convenient for me. And then the other one, um, a lot of times will go into it when he's shedding and that's where I'll find his sheds, but they don't go and live in them or use them anymore. They use the other stuff in their enclosure. And they had a hunt, like I didn't do anything to encourage it one way or the other. Like I set up the opportunity and they were free to choose. And that's what I've observed. And I've done that since um, in a less formal manner. And I see the same thing. Like some of them will use the tub as a hide or um, return to it from time to time, but they're using the whole enclosure and they're spending more time in the enclosure at large than they are in their little tub. And so did that surprise me? It didn't surprise me because I never understood why anyone would keep an animal in a drawer. Like I, to me, that just wasn't fathomable. Like I'm like, why would someone do, like, it just seems so alien to me of why you would keep wild animals in drawers. Like I just didn't understand it coming into this world and starting to work with snakes and other reptiles it just seemed weird like I would never would never occur to me to take a wild animal and not try to keep it as close to how it how it lives in the wild as possible so I wasn't surprised at at that at all but I didn't have an expectation that that's what the result would be because for all I knew they were raised in racks maybe that's what they would prefer because that's what they knew you know that's possible I mean I I I'm, I, all I can do is observe and tell you the outcome. And the outcome is, you know, they were exhibiting stereotypies in just the tub alone. When I moved the tub to a viv, they started coming out of the tub and using the viv. And the only way that we can know anything like that for sure is to do these preference tests. So breeders certainly could attach some of their rack uh, tubs to a viv. You can take a hole saw and cut a hole in it and put a PVC tunnel in and attach 10 rack drawers to 10 bivs and see for yourself what the animals use or not. I mean, that's super easy to do, but you can't only have them in one environment and say, that's what they prefer. I can't have a snake only in this viv and say, oh, they prefer vivs because this snake's doing well in it. I can't say that unless they have another option. And so I can't take a rack and say they prefer racks if they have no other option. Like if they have no other preference to show me, I can't make that statement because I don't know that. You have to give them two or more options and observe what they do. I mean, it's just very simple. It's preference testing at that basic level is simple. It can get more complicated depending on what, your, what preferences you're trying to test. But as far as do you wanna live here or live here? Super easy to set up two conditions and attach them together and see where the snake chooses to spend its time. So are you seeing any sort of difference between prey items? I know some people watched my, my, my Sammy Boro video and, and how I showed how in Nigeria and whatnot they were eating a large proportion of birds. And I know a lot of people that then try to mimic that and give them 70% of the diet avian prey. Are you noticing any sort of 
preference from the animals, or is it just because of the way you're training, they snatch and they pretty much eat anyway? Some of them have a preference. Like the one older royal I have, he seems to only want to eat mice, and that's fine. I have a jungle carpet python that does not like rats. She eats mice, quail, chicks. I don't know that I've tried a refulink with her, but you know, she eats other stuff. She just doesn't like rats. So yeah, I've noticed preferences. Um, some, some of my, my Papuan carpet pythons, the ones from West Papua New Guinea, they are the picky. I feel like they're the pickiest eaters. Pick, they, they like mice. And it's been difficult for me to get them to eat other things. Like I have one that's five years old that just this year started also eating rats, you know, but I've offered her all kinds of other stuff like quail and chicks and she just like the mice, but now she's also eating rats too. Um, so I don't think it's just the species. Like you can't just say, oh, royal pythons only like this. I think snakes in general are going to have preferences and certain individuals are going to like certain foods and some aren't. And it may be because of how they were right, raised or trained or that it's just they've only ever eaten the one kind and they're not into new things and so they're not going to try a new kind. Um, some just are showing me more generalized behavior as far as eating than others do, but it's not tied for the most part to a specific species. Like some of my royals eat buried prey and some don't. Some of my carpet pythons eat buried prey and some don't. Um, my brettles pythons, they're the ones that, the brettles pythons, the corn snakes, the bull snakes, the king snakes, well, those are the species that I would list off that say they've eaten everything I've ever offered them, like including reptilinks and fish. Like if it's food, they're eating it. But some of them are less apt to do that. Royals are less apt to do that jungle carpet pythons some of the uh, the pop and carpet pythons are less apt to do that my inland carpet pythons which are supposedly the same species morelia spilota as the other carpets they'll eat anything so i think you can't make a generalization a big generalization or a specific you know royals will eat very prey is it super common no and is it not common because we just don't offer it or we don't raise them that way. Like if breeders were raising them on different prey, would they eat a variety of items when they got to their new homes? I don't know. I think what happens is people get them to eat and then they're afraid to change the food because they might stop eating. But you know what? I just offer them stuff randomly and they either they don't. If they don't eat it, then I go give them right away. I give them the food they like, you know, and then they eat that. So I don't have any snakes here that don't eat or that have gone off food because I've offered them something different or gotten stuck on a certain food item other than like the pop and carpet pythons I keep coming back to because I have eight of them and I only have two that eat anything other than mice. Why is that? I don't know. I mean, they're more picky than the royals for sure. And they also are slower learners and they seem less adaptable to change than the royals, but it's only that one subspecies of carpet python. It's not the others. It's interesting. I wonder how much of that is perhaps like someone might breed rats so they don't actually want the animal to develop a preference for elsewhere and then stop accepting the rat, which is why they're like, oh, it has to eat rats. And then someone gets told by their breeder that, oh, yeah, it has to eat rats. And then the whole thing kind of spreads. Otherwise, I don't see any reason why people are so obsessed with taking them off the scale and getting them to that end point, which is rats. Like, I, I don't see why, logically, that that happens. I mean, I, I, do, I don't know. That's a, per, that's a human thing. I mean, humans are doing that. That's nothing the animals are doing. What can happen, that's also a human-mediated behavior, is if we scare the animal. If, if an animal in the wild becomes a, afraid of some potential prey item, it's probably not going to eat that again. It's probably not going to try to acquire that prey item again because it had an aversive experience with it. Like if it was going after, I don't know, what are in the wild royal pythons environment. It was going after some kind of bird and it was too big and the bird ended up like pecking the snake or picking the snake up and flying off with it and dropping it. The snake's probably not going to go after that bird again because that was not a beneficial consequence to the behavior of trying to predate on that bird. So if something adverse like that happens under captive management, 
like we scare the animal while we're feeding it or something scary happens that has nothing to do with feeding, but it just happened to take place at the same time I was offering food, the animal can have an emotional response in that moment and associate that negative experience with the food and then not want to eat that food again. So sometimes it's not even the food, but it's what happened when it was offered this food. Did it get scared? Did something, because frightening experiences, they embed in the memory much more solidly and remain stronger for longer than non-bad memories, unfortunately. But if you think of that from an adaptive perspective, if something bad happens to you in the wild, you need to remember what caused that bad thing so that you don't repeat that or that you don't encounter that thing again that almost killed you. And so if bad experiences happen to us or snakes, we're gonna remember that and everything associated with that much more clearly than we remember all the good stuff. And that's just the way that our neurobiology works. And so if the snake gets scared or distressed during a feed, whether it has to do with the food or not, they can associate that feeling of distress and displeasure with the food and then start to not want that food. And that's where you have to change the context or the environment, either feed it in a different environment, the same food, or feed it a different food in the same environment to, to snap it out of that. I've got several that I've taken on that I think in a previous home, they've panicked because they're in that fast period and then they've offered to the point where they've scared that royal repeatedly trying to offer it and um he will eat anything else but you bring that wrap that is what is been repeatedly offered and he absolutely does not want it and that doesn't bother me because I'll just feed him everything else but I think sometimes when they're like oh it's a really picky feeder really they've had that scary experience they've smelt that rat and then that's what keeps getting offered they haven't realized that that fear has been paired to it and then they're just right damage and keep offering yeah I've had a few that have come here from breeders that feed live and I like the snake will just be like cruising around and I've got the lid off or I've got the door open and they're like tongue flicking and looking at me and they're perfectly comfortable relaxed and then I I bring the food out and they revert to a completely fearful body posture. They start trembling, they coil back, um, some will hide. I mean, clearly they're having a fear response to the food because I was just interacting with them and they were fine. And I introduced the food and it's a definite fear response. So obviously something happened to them previously, whether it was with that live feeder, you know, a bad experience or something happened that now they're afraid of the food. And some snakes are over, able to overcome that after a time because they get so hungry that the hunger now outweighs the displeasurable experience they had with the food. Some never do and they just shut down and stop eating if you don't offer them anything else. It just depends on on the coping style of the animal and how resilient they are. Do you notice their body condition improve once they've been offered the opportunity to exercise and whatnot? Do you see muscle tone improve? Or... Absolutely. My bet is always, she says, your snakes are so fit. She'll listen to the heart. She said this the last visit, she was listening to the heart on one and she says, this snake is so fit. And then she palpates them and holds them. And she's like, this snake is so muscular. The snake is so strong. The snake, you know, has such great body condition versus one I took in earlier this year that was relinquished as an adult and she's like, oh my gosh, this snake's obese, it needs to lose weight, it doesn't have any muscle mass, it's got all fat, don't worry about it eating for a long time. <laughs> so I think my vet notices it more than I do because I, most of my snakes are pretty fit. So if I do end up handling them, they all feel strong, like they feel strong and solid in my hands. But when I'll I've gotten a few as older snakes and they feel kind of squishy or flaccid. I mean, yeah, I can tell that they don't have muscle tone, that they don't have that strength. And when they're trying to climb or move around, you can see them trembling versus the ones that do it all the time are like, they'll go across a clothesline and not fall because they have the muscle, the muscular development and capability to do that because they've exercised and built it up. I think that links to because you see so much where people are like 
Royal pythons shouldn't be offered an opportunity to climb because they're so clumsy. They'll just fall. It's like, well, maybe it's because they haven't been allowed to and therefore it's like asking us to climb across monkey bars and have never done it before. They get better at it because like Sarek, this little, um, he's sleeping right now, but this one I have, he was very bold and outgoing and was trying to climb everything and he fell several times. Well, I don't want to say several times. He fell a couple of times and I was spotting him. So on the higher stuff, I stand underneath them in case they do fall and I catch them because I also feel like that probably fosters trust between us. If they know if they fall, I catch them, but then I just put them right back in their exercise space. Um, actually that only happened two or three times with him. And now, man, he does some scary things when I'm watching him and I'm like, you're going to fall. You're gonna, and he doesn't fall because he learned, he adapted, you know, he learned from those falls, what not to do. He's gotten more skilled over time. He's better at it. I mean, that's what happens when we do anything, when we learn a physical activity. We're clumsy at it at first, and then we get better at it. Is Sarek the one that you sent me the footage of him doing the Constantina locomotion up a vertical branch? Oh, no, that's a different one. Um, I, I have two that I think I filmed doing that locomotion up a vertical branch, like the reticulated python climb. And they're, they're both, I have a couple of royals that do that. Now, yeah, Sarek will do that, but he wasn't the one in the video I sent you. That was a different one named Quinlan, and he's just learning it. Like, I think that's the, only the second time that he had done that behavior. And you can see how slow it was and how he was trying to figure out what to do. And I guarantee six months from now, you know, he'll be doing it quickly. So have you noticed any sort of, like, temperature reference in them? Or have you just not been researching that and taking data on that? I'm not specifically taking data on that, but I do know they spend more time on the coo in the cooler portion of their enclosures than they do the warmer portion. And so when I say cooler, I mean in the 70s, like 74 to 76, like they spend more time there than they do in the end that gets 85 or 90 degrees. Um, one of mine, we just had central air conditioning installed a few days ago. And so now I'm trying to work out how to run our house air conditioner and keep the snakes at an optimal temperature. And um, one of the royals did get too cold. He was sitting at 70 degrees. So I put um, a little heat mat, like one of those travel heat things that when you ship snakes, you put in there. I put one of those in there with him just for the night and he slept on it all night. So he moved over to it and he slept on it during the night. So 70 was obviously too cold for him. But then his hot spot, which gets in the 90s, he avoids that if I let it get that high and tends to like the hot spot more in the 80s. But they don't, a mine don't spend that much time in their hot spots. They're spending more time in that mid 70s range Fahrenheit. I don't know what that translates to to centigrade without looking it up. I'll Celsius put it on the screen something. for all the. British people and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> the whole rest of the world other than the United States. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't see them seeking out super hot conditions. I see them staying in the mid 70s, lower 80s most of the time, but I'm not collecting data on it. It's just what I observe. That's fair enough. Have you seen any behavioral differences between the sexes? Oh, yes. I I definitely do. I have about half and half, and the males are the ones that are coming out more often, that are more active, that are more interactive and engaging. The females are just less, less um, apt to come out and engage in activities outside of their home habitat than the males are. The males are roamers, and the females just are content in their habitats, as long as their habitats have stuff for them to do. You know, like they're not content if I just put them in a shoebox, then they're trying to get out. Um, occasionally I'll have a female come out and roam around and explore. Like the one I said that took the tracks off her sliding door and got out. But, you know, I don't know how much roaming she did because when I found her, she was under a bookshelf all coiled up, you know, resting. The males roam, like I find them all over the place and I have to like walk around with them and watch where they're going and it can be hours before they find a spot to sit, settle down. 
So that's just what I observe here is the males tend to be more of the roamers and the females um, are just more content to stay around their home uh, vivarium. I think that roughly correlates with what a lot of people observe with with what they've been said in studies and whatnot as well. That would ex- that would kind of explain why they have seen like ectoparasite differences between the sexes as well and stuff. Mm. I think it makes sense if the males are the ones that have to go out and find mates, then I think they're going to have that innate urge to roam more than the females are. But I don't know if that's the case in the wild. I mean, you you might know because you look at a lot of natural history papers. Whichever species, whichever sex is the one that does the mate seeking is likely going to be the one that's more active and roam more under captive management because they have that inert innate urge to do that so would you say your roaming males behavior is in relation to the breeding season or that's just them all year round i sort of see it all year round i mean maybe not that could be just completely animal i would have to i've started tracking um boba fets so we'll know in a year or two like I did a study of one with one of my Brettles pythons and I tracked his behavior for two years and he spent um, 88% of his awake time out of his viv. So basically his viv was where he went to sleep and rest and the rest of the time he spent out roaming, hunting, moving. Um, I'm doing, I just started keeping track like three days ago with this one Royal Boba Fett. So we'll see how that compares. But the only way for me to tell you for sure is to do that, like actually write it down and track it because me just saying, well, yeah, I think it varies. That's just me subjectively watching my animals and telling you, I think this is what they do. And I might be totally wrong. I could be confabulating that. You know, I mean, that's our brains aren't that accurate. We need to write stuff down and take video because our brains trick us all the time. (laughs) And which is why you have a channel full of videos. Yes. I take so many videos, my phone and my cameras fill up all the time and I have to delete stuff. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to delete this, but I need more space. I think we're hitting the two hour mark now. Have you got anything else you want to add, Ellie? I think we've covered everything that I think a lot of people will need to chew on. And I imagine a lot of people will have a whole world open to them in regard to Python Reach's behavior now. So thank you very much for coming on, Laurie. And I think everyone who owns a Royal Python needs to be watching Laurie's channel. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And if you go to my website, there's, a, there's all kinds of resources on there, but there's a page that says where to find Lori and her work. I've got that on there now because it lists the articles I've written, the interviews I've done, and then all of those link to addition, all of the resources that I use to write those articles and papers because I want people to be able to look up this information for themselves don't just take my word for it. And when you're looking at a paper, because I I refer to a lot of papers that aren't specifically snake related. So when you're reading about a study that's been done on rats, you know, we have to be able to now apply that to people or apply that to other species. And so when you do that, you read the paper, then you think, okay, have there been papers like this done on snakes? And with like the social learning aspect, I was able to find a paper done on reptiles. With the training, I was able to find other papers where people had trained snakes. But if you don't find other research, so like, let's say I'm looking at a paper that's done on rats and it talks about fear learning. If I don't find a a paper that's similar on snakes, then I have to start saying, okay, does this logically apply to snakes? And how can I, I, I articulate that it does. Okay, snakes have the same neurochemicals, snakes have these same brain structures. And then when I put it into practice or when I observe snake behavior, I'm seeing the same things that they saw in this other species. So you have to do a little bit of work to apply some of these studies to species that haven't specifically been studied, but we, it's doable, it just takes a lot of work. And that's what I try to do in my articles and my videos. I think that's perfect. We'll make sure that people can either find that in the show notes or in the description on YouTube. Okay, perfect. I really appreciate you guys inviting me on the show.
And I'm glad to see that you're part of the Animals at Home Network, such a positive network for reptile keepers. I hope so. And I think that going forward, I think that we're going to try and accomplish a lot of things when we have guests like yourself coming on. So thank you and much I love for what on. Ellie's doing with her royals and how she knows each one's individual personality and she helps owners match owners with the appropriate one. I mean, that's perfect because then those people are less likely to be unhappy with their snake. So great job, Ellie. I'm really happy to hear that you're doing that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you guys very much. Thank you very much for coming on.